Good evening. I'm Dr. Oli Tweedy. Welcome to this Intensive Care Society webinar sponsored by Synthetica Limited, making time for care on the ICU. Firstly, a few points I'm sure you are now familiar with. You will be muted throughout the webinar. To ask questions, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom. You can do this throughout the webinar. The speakers will join me at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. The recording of the webinar will be available on the RCS site at the end of the week. If we have unanswered questions at the end of the webinar, we will try to include these in this recording. Stress, burnout and staff welfare have probably always been issues on the intensive care, but never more so than now. Finding ways to improve care and making time available for patient care has never been easy, but the focus has and always will be caring for patients. Over the next hour, we will deliver four presentations from a multidisciplinary team, three of whom work together at the Royal Salary NHS Foundation Trust, a nurse, a doctor, a pharmacist, and an economist. Each presenter will focus on a different aspect of how you can implement change, improve safety, reduce risk, save nursing time, and do this all in a cost-effective way. Concepts will be presented generally with the example of a ready-to-administer noradrenaline to demonstrate how you can make time for care on the ICU. Our first speaker is Elaine Crichton, Senior Sister and Practice Development Lead in Critical Care. Hello, my name's Elaine Crichton. Um, I'm more commonly known as Squirrel to my friends and my work colleagues. Um, I'm a senior sister on intensive care at the Royal Surrey Foundation Trust, and I'm coming up for my 27th year working here this year. And I've been a senior sister for the last 20 years as well. So um, you could say I'm a little averse to change. Um, I have also taken on the mantle of being the practice development lead. So I split my shifts. So I do a half clinical to keep my clinical skills up. And then I'm also heavily involved in training any of the new staff and a lot of overseas nurses that we've been having over the last few years, training them up and getting them used to the things that we do on our intensive care unit, which can be actually quite different to what they're used to. When I first started on the intensive care unit, we had a four bedded um, unit. Uh, all the patients were ventilated and we also had a four bedded coronary care unit. Um, the nursing staff was very experienced, um, a lot of uh, the equivalent of band sixes and sevens. So there was a lot of experience, a lot of training that went on. So it's, in my mind, it was very sort of top heavy. Uh, when I started, we only ever had um, like two intakes of, new pay, of newbies a year. So there was uh, quite intensive training for us. Uh, we were taught, you know, very high quality patient care for intensive care patients. So um, a lot of things have changed since then um, in as much as our workforce has sort of um, turned around. So we have a lot more band five nurses, a lot more overseas nurses who um, basically have come to this country. They are not used to the equipment that we use. They're not used to the amount of autonomy we have on our intensive care in particular as nurses. And um, uh, they also find it, you know, quite a challenging uh, coming to a new country and, um, you know, learning how we do things. Uh, so things have definitely changed over the 27 years that I've been here. Uh, so we had to increase our number of nurses because we had to increase our bed numbers. So going from four ventilated, um, you know, I suppose the equivalent of level three back then, uh, we're now at the equivalent of 14 level three beds. Uh, the coronary care got moved to a medical ward and uh, we now have the equivalent of 14 level three beds, but it's often a mixture between level two and level three patients. So we could have, you know, over 20 patients at any one time. So the whole sort of, uh, you know, demographic of the patient um, changed as well. So we are now a tertiary referral centre for upper GI, HPB, 
And we've got a really big cancer centre here. So we do lots of high risk cancer surgeries. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of patients who are self-ventilating. They're on enhanced recovery pathways, um, but we have to mobilise them. Uh, we have to give them good pain relief. And uh, there's an awful lot for all of these new nurses to learn. And quite often these patients will require um, some vasopressor of some sort. We tend to use noradrenaline here um, to help maintain their blood pressure. Um, and they're usually on it for a, for a few days. So a few years ago, as a senior team, we noticed that there, had, there was becoming an increasing instance of um, patients' uh, hemodynamic instability. And we weren't really sure what was going on. Uh, we spoke to some of the junior nurses and a lot of them were actually quite fearful of um, using noradrenaline. And the, the fact was we were doing a double pumping technique. So we had two syringe drivers. Um, so we'd have one syringe driver running and then we would slowly decrease one and increase the other to do the double pumping. Or that's how it was meant to be. But what we discovered that there was actually quite a lack of consistency in the training that we were doing. So, um, again, I hold my hands up. I, I would probably do what um, somebody might call a smash and grab. So I would whip out the syringe, put the new one in and, you know, do it that way. So, you know, I was probably as guilty for causing confusion. Um, but the juniors were actually really quite concerned about this. They weren't keen on double pumping. Um, and quite often I did have um, shifts where the juniors would say, Sister Squirrel, could you please change my noradrenaline for me? Um, this obviously was very detrimental to the patients. We did not want that. It was an increased patient risk. And also it was causing quite a stressful um, working environment for the junior nurses. And that was a bit of a cause concern for concern as well. Um, because, you know, it's already a stressful place to work anyway, intensive care. And what we don't want is to add to that stress. So as a senior team, we had a meeting and one of our sisters had recently done an agency shift at another unit and they had been using a volumetric pump for their noradrenaline um, in a hundred mil bag, but with the same concentration that we were used to using. So we decided to trial it, um, use volumetric pump. So it was a continuous caterpillar sort of motion, uh, no risk of um, mechanical slack um, and things like that. So we trialled it and it was an absolute hit. Uh, the junior staff were pleased. Predominantly, the patients were more stable. There was a big decrease in the hemodynamic instability of the patients. The nursing staff, the juniors in particular, were much happier. Um, so all they had to do was obviously just re-spike a bag um, there was none of this double pumping business and um, it, all in all, it was kind of like quite a quite a good win. Um, everyone seemed to be happy and 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 we've we've continued to use that technique. We haven't had any issues at all. So we've sort of removed the need for double pumping. So that's been a definite um, benefit to our patients, but also to our junior workforce. I think we were all thinking um, coming, you know, a, couple of years ago, is there anything else that we could actually do to try and enhance the working environment for, for the bedside nurse? You know, because we were still mixing all of our drugs and things like that um, at the bedside. So I think there was a group of us that were sort of wondering where we could go with that. So then, as you know, we got hit in March 2020 with uh, the pandemic COVID-19. And I can honestly say I've never experienced anything like this in the whole of my 27 years on intensive care. It was stressful and it was frightening. And I've never seen so many sick patients um, all ventilated um, at one time. It was, you know, it was kind of the world had gone crazy. And I could see the fear in the, our juniors, um, our band fives, their faces every day because they were having to look after two or three of these patients on a shift. And it was so incredibly stressful. And I know that probably all of you experienced something very similar. Um, the first wave obviously was extremely tough um, because it was something new 
um, something that we've never experienced before. And I did extra shifts. Um, I did practically all nights. Uh, so I did. I was doing like four nights a week for three months, four months and um, try to help keep morale up and support the nurses um, looking after these really sick patients. And it was, you know, it was just just really, really hard work. Um, what I did notice during, you know, one of my memorable night shifts was a group of the nursing staff outside of the COVID bays. Um, they were in this at the CD cupboard and um, they were just snapping these ampules and drawing up diluent and writing labels and things like that. And um, this is all for our morphine and midazolam infusions that we were using for all of our patients. Um, that was our go to sedation. And they were just there, a production line of nurses snapping ampules and, you know, drawing these infusions up. And it was crazy. It just didn't stop because every patient was ventilated. Every patient needed the sedation. They also needed the vasopressors as well. So they were making up noradrenaline as well. And it was continuous. It was just never ending. They were there. And as soon as they'd finished one patient, they'd have to go on to the next and the next. And then by the time they'd done all of that, they'd have to start again. And, you know, I could see the risk of sharp injuries from the ampules, the big risk to patients because of mixing, you know, drugs up, making drug errors. It's, you know, it's very, very, um, you know, that's actually quite stressful thinking about it now. You know, and I'm, I have to say that, you know, drug errors were made be, um, because we were, you know, doing everything so quickly and all together. Um, and, you know, also drawing up of the solutions as well is actually really bad for your wrists and your fingers. And doing that continuously for pretty much 14 hours was, I would say, shocking. Um, Towards the end of the first wave, our pharmacist at the time, Joe, and one of our consultants managed to procure um, some pre, um, pre-filled pre vials of noradrenaline that were ready to administer. Um, and they were the same standard um, concentration that we use. So we started using them. Um, that made life um, easier towards the end of that first wave. And I think it was definitely something that I, I think a group of us were thinking, actually, we probably need to start rethinking how we how we sort out our drugs, how we draw up our drugs. And, you know, we need to have a real think about that. We continue to use the pre-filled um, vials of noradrenaline uh, and we had that sort of hiatus of a few months, didn't we, before the second wave started. The second wave, I think, was worse than the first. The morale was was much worse, was much lower. It was very difficult to try and keep everyone sort of propped up. But also we were dealing with even more patients, younger patients, sicker patients. And, you know, frankly, again, it was just it was just the nightmare repeating itself. But one of the things that did, I think, change for us, and it was just like a little glimmer of hope, was that our pharmacists and consultants agreed to get pre-filled syringes of morphine and midazolam for our sedation. And we continued to use the ready to administer vials of noradrenaline. And it just made such a difference. I can't really explain to you. And I know it sounds a bit silly, but it just meant that the nurses weren't having to crack all those ampules, draw up the diluents. There was much reduced risk of, of drug errors. So increased patient safety, which is obviously what we all want. Um, and also it freed up some of the nurses to come and help with the actual patients. So it just meant that we were able to do a bit more nursing care. We were able to do a bit more eye care, a little bit more mouth care, rub the patient's feet, just, you know, just simple things like that. It just meant that we were able to care for our patients a little bit better than the, the first wave. And I know it sounds a bit strange that something so simple could do that, but I kid you not, it really did make a difference. And, and like any nurse, we were all quite excited about something kind of like already made for us anyway. Um, they're very easily um, to recognise. They're well labelled. They're different colours. And so, you know, there's no there's no issue with getting anything modelled up. So it's it's, um, you know, I think it took a massive uh, strain off of us. And I think the fact that it did free up some nursing time to care for the patients 
was also a real benefit. So it is something that, you know, I would really like for us to continue to use because I think to be able to free up nursing time to spend on our very sick patients is probably one of the most key things that, that we can do. And, you know, and that's what we're here for, really, is to provide the best patient care that we possibly can. So just to conclude, I've recently found this quote, which I think nicely summarises our experience in intensive care at the Royal Surrey um, by Lord Carter of Coles. He says the true cost, considering staff availability, time, safe patient care, consumables and the risk of repetitive strain injuries for nurses, balances this cost pressure by ensuring our clinical staff time is focused on the essential needs to care for the patient. So I really like that just to summarise everything. This was a really good opportunity for me to share my experiences with you and I very much appreciate you listening and I hope that you found it interesting. Thank you. Elaine, thank you for sharing your experience and, uh, and personal story. Um, please keep the questions uh, coming in, everybody. Um, we probably will, they probably will be answered during the course of the rest of the presentations, but please bring them in, bring them in and uh, we'll, we'll uh, answer those towards the end. So our next presentation uh, is from Doc, Dr. Justin Coke bailey consultant intensivist and anaesthetist. He is also the professional director of therapeutics. Justin's presentation is titled, Oranges are not the only fruit, syringes are not the only root. Thank you, Justin. Hello there, thanks for joining us. Um, my talk follows on a bit from a letter in the last edition of Anesthesia News from the Association of Anesthetists, which in turn follows on from an article there about syringes, labeling and how we use them. There's no talk about growing up lesbian in the north of England, but more about how we take things for granted, both in anaesthesia and intensive care, because there's similarity, but also difference. And about how oftentimes when we're focusing on aspects of medication and safety, we forget some key aspects, human aspects, and we need to change that. My relevant disclosure is that I've received income for providing advice to Synthetica. So, who am I? Well, I'm a jobbing intensivist and anaesthetist in Guildford, Surrey, medium-sized district general hospital with a disproportionately large-sized intensive care unit that allows us to provide post-operative excellence for major cancer surgeries and high-risk patients. And you're meeting some of my colleagues as well. I have got a reputation usually for my passion for ultrasound, both its use for regional anaesthesia and point of care diagnostics in intensive care and beyond, and you may have heard me talk about that. But I've also got another job that's a bit unusual for the district general hospital, I'm in effect the clinical director of pharmacy, the filling in the sandwich between pharmacy and the hospital. And it allows me to be objective in both directions, understanding clinical issues that impact on pharmacy and very much vice versa. I haven't met someone else in my role elsewhere yet, but I definitely think every hospital should have one, not least of which because it's really enjoyable, especially when you can join with pharmacists and make changes to things that make differences to people. That's staff and the patients as well, of course. So then, Rear Admiral Grace Murray Hopper, who was a pioneering computer scientist, said that the most damaging phrase in the language is we've always done it this way. Not wanting to pass up on a geeky reference of sorts, if you've watched The Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus, you'll have heard the words, this is the way. But if you've been in receipt of learning about how things are done in intensive care, you may have heard something similar perhaps in response to an inquiry as to why something we do is done that way. But in reality, every process or procedure is up for re-evaluation. It's part of quality improvement, which doesn't have to imply novelty or new things, just perhaps new ways of doing old things or the alignment of two old things to make something new. There are undoubtedly barriers to change. There's fear of something new, suspicion and disbelief. So steps towards change often have to be taken incrementally rather than a big bang. And the use of champions or superheroes and role models too 
There's enough material there for a whole new talk. As Elaine explains, the last year has been interesting, to say the least, but much as though, like everyone else, trying to keep your head above water has been part of the daily requirement. There's been an opportunity for some on fellow skepsis, some navel gazing, a reevaluation of what constitutes our normality. Because sometimes it's times like these that makes you realise what you think about your normal isn't that great, especially if you apply it to a novel situation. Say, you know, having to deal with a 200% or more increase into what's considered your maximal intensive care capacity. You start to realise what actually matters. You start to realise where the chinks in your armour are, where those holes in the big Swiss cheese are that could align at any moment leading to hindrance, like worst harm. If you're to look at industry, for example, if you're doing something time and time again, what do you do? You automate it. Or at least you look at the number of steps required and work hard to reduce them to minimise time and the potential for problems. With a lot more patients, we've seen a lot of repetitions and the consequences. So if you're a busy nurse or doctor trying to look after more than the usual number of patients, what do you want? More staff, obviously. That isn't going to happen. We know it. So the gift of time becomes precious. As a man, I can't multitask, so my ex ICU nurse wife, wife tells me. But to be fair, no one really can, not least in a busy intensive care unit. At best, you can task split, dividing your attention between tasks without giving 100% to any of them, really. Which means that that patient for whom you're trying to keep the sedation in just the sweet spot, for whom that sweet spot seems quite small and the risk is that they might pull their own ET tube, and for whom the sedation just seems to be a little bit too hypotensive and so requires presses. You may do something unspeakable if your back is turned any longer than a second. Do you know how that feels? It fills you with dread. And that syringe of noradrenaline isn't going to fill itself, and you're even going to have to get a colleague to help you, detracting them from what they were doing too. If you only had a little longer to get things right, you wouldn't have to do 11 things at once. And Joe will talk to you about medication risk and error and what happens then. So this is where problems come in. Trying to keep the plates spinning or the balls in the air in intensive care is just getting harder. Modern intensive care is becoming more complex and successful too, more equipment and drugs. And we know that the patient population, of course, is changing as well. So it all conspires to detract from what little time at the bedside there is. And if you're not on the ball, you can treat, but you may not have time to actually care. So the problem now is that the syringe is made up, but you have to start it and stop the current one too somehow, whilst concentrating on all the other things. This, my friends, is double pumping or piggybacking. The stuff of nightmares, starting, stopping, upping, downing and changing infusion rates. Apparently, there's an act to it, or what we call experience, which is great if you've been doing the job for a number of years, but not so much if you're new and you're hoping, nay praying, that the blood pressure stays roughly the same as when you started for 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes when you are, of course, doing something else as well. So there is another way. It's 2021. Get a computer to do it or not. Poirot and colleagues published an article in the British Journal of Anesthesia late last year looking at the best way to continue pressure or infusions. The choices were double pumping or piggybacking and manual rate changing with noradrenaline, what I refer to as smash and grab, where you just disconnect one syringe and apply the other one as fast as you possibly can, or a synchronised computer changeover system. Which do you think was best? Well, obviously, the smash and grab system, of course. But what do I mean by best? The one with the least amount of hemodynamic instability. Is that important? Well, if you look at the supplementary material for the paper, it was. And if you're interested in a particular journal article and there is supplementary material, I commend you to look at it. You'd be amazed at what gets tucked away in there. In this trial, over 10% of the patients had clinically relevant adverse events. One cardiac arrest, for significant arrhythmias in just under 300 syringe changes just in day-to-day -day practice on an intensive care unit. Even transient blood pressure variation can lead to mortality and morbidities 
including increased risks of renal and cardiac complications. So why would we want to put ourselves and our patients through this unnecessary process? I mean, imagine if there was another way. Imagine if you could just spike a vial of Pressor, sedation, whatever, when the last one was about to run out and carry on with care. Just connect the bottle to a gravity-fed volumetric pump and be done with it. You probably already do that with some things on your intensive care unit, obviously with intense uh, with intravenous fluids. I'm assuming no one uses syringes for those. You may already be spiking bottles of propofol. Although in theatres as an anaesthetist, I'm thwarted by having to draw from those bottles into syringes and then to infuse from them. But that's because sometimes I use target controlled infusions for anaesthesia. I'm not aware at the moment of any gravity fed volumetric TCI pump. But there's no reason why my phenylephrine, metaraminol, nor adrenaline or other drugs couldn't be in bottles or at the least be ready to administer without the time required to prepare, especially on some days when I make it up and it's just thrown away. Wage stitch too, you see. I mean, literally throwing money away. So it's definitely time to think about doing things differently in our world. You may be aware of Lord Carter of Cole's reports into efficiencies and cost saving potentials in the NHS. He's been championing the concept of the model hospital, whereby if you were to take all the best bits of individual services and put them together, you could make a truly model hospital with associated savings and efficiencies. Well, last year he looked at medicines. He noticed that ready to administer medicines could make a key impact for the staff in critical care, and quite honestly, not a moment too soon. It was a realisation from him that nurses were taking just far too much time making up, diluting and checking drugs which were used time and time again in daily practice. Well, you know, I mentioned earlier about more staff. If you took the top 12 most used injectable medicines used in intensive care in the UK and had them as ready to administer versions, how many hours of nursing time do you think that would free up? Thousands? 100,000? Try 8.3 million. That's a lot. What does that mean in terms of staffing? What does that mean in terms of nurses? It's the equivalent of having 4,000 extra full-time nurses. Wouldn't we like to have them? Some of the issues, it seems, is that when we do look around our intensive care units, when we decide we can't stand still and we want to change things, is that people only see things in terms of money and not people. You can't put a person into the cell of an Excel spreadsheet. Back to Lord Carter of Coles. The true cost, considering staff availability, time, safe patient care, consumables, and the risk of repetitive strain injuries for nurses, balances cost pressures by ensuring our clinical staff time is focused on the essential needs to care for the patient. And he wrote that in a letter to ministers. So somebody up there also agrees with what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Hmm. So changing things incrementally, slowly. It's an opportunity, isn't it? It's an opportunity this year now that the pandemic is sort of settling down a bit. It's an opportunity for us to have a look at what we're doing in every way, shape and form on the intensive care unit, to have a look at how we use medicines to make some changes, maybe slowly, maybe quickly, to make something that makes a real difference to our staff and to our patients, to up our game, ready, hopefully not for the next third wave, but who knows, but we've got some breathing space. There are some opportunities, certainly within the realms of budgetary constraints, financial constraints, medications, risks and errors. There are opportunities now that we've got some breathing room to be able to do something and to do something maybe to make everybody realise that Oranges aren't the only fruit, syringes aren't the only root, and maybe, just maybe, orange is the new black. Thank you. Justin, thank you so much. Uh, your, your presentations get uh, better year on year. <clears throat> I'm not going to suggest the reason for that, but that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, it seems so obvious now that you've pointed it out to us. So our next presentation is from Ed Griffin. Ed is a health economist and associate research fellow at the University of Exeter. 
It has uh, developed a budget impact model for Synthetica that will demonstrate how a ready to administer noradrenaline is cost effective and can free up nursing time for patient care. It will give us an introduction to health economics uh, and bring this to life with an example. Its presentation is titled Quantitative Assessment of Health Innovation. Thank you, Ed. Hello, everyone. My name is Ed Griffin. I'm a health economist. I'm an associate research fellow at the University of Exeter, and I'm also an independent consultant. Recently, I've been working with Synthetica to build uh, a tool which quantifies a resource of ready to use noradrenaline um, uh, under a range of assumptions. After introducing some concepts in this presentation, I'll be turning to uh, the case for ready to use noradrenaline uh, in England. So as a health economist, um, what do we do? Well, we ask about the health system and how it works and for whom, and we apply economic principles. Um, we try to maximize allocative and productive efficiency in a framework of ex equity and choice. Now, you know, given how big UK spending is on healthcare, and this was about 164 billion pounds for 2020, or planned at least at the time, um, you know, this, this is an important process. Also, when you consider just how many, uh, how, how large the NHS is in terms of the number of people working for them and all the decisions that are made um, through consumption and procurement, essentially resources are large and there is an inherent risk of loss through inefficiency. Um, so here are some basic um, but key economic principles to remember as we go forward in the presentation. And these are the same ones that underpin the recommendations of NICE. Um, scarcity of resources. Well, um, there's clearly a scarcity of resources because we don't have the money to provide everything for everyone that we would like. And scarcity dictates that economic decisions um, must be made in order to manage the availability of resources to meet needs as best as we can. Um, the principle of incremental analysis, and this requires the comparative analysis of alternative courses of actions in terms of their costs and resources and the consequences um, of any chosen strategy. Nothing is actually cost effective on its own. Also opportunity cost, um, and this is simply uh, the benefit that could have been enjoyed had we chosen the best alternative choice to that which we, we have chosen. And just to illustrate this point about opportunity, well, um, what are the alternative options if we spend £3,300 on one course of IVF? Now, in terms of healthcare, um, that amount of money or one course of IVF is a, equivalent to half a cochlear implant, nine cataract removals, heart bypass, and quite a lot of vaccinations. And outside healthcare, because the concept is, is transferable across all governmental spend, um, you know, we, we, we could have a third of a police constable for a year, 5,000 school dinners, um, and a very small part of a challenger tank. But I hope, you know, the, the idea is there um, that we must spend carefully. Um, in fact, you know, just to underline that Economics is relevant, very relevant, and the Department of Health and Social Care seeks to ensure the expenditure um, represents value for money. As we've said, the NHS does not have enough resources to do everything. Uh, if we do spend more on one thing, we would have to do less on something else. And similarly, uh, if the NHS spends poorly in one area, then less health gain is attainable overall. Um, so here are common economic approaches to evaluate value um, on our health investments. We have cost effectiveness analysis, uh, and this is where we seek to measure in natural units such as um, the cost per life year saved or change in blood pressure, um, blood pressure cost of blood pressure reduction. Um, but these, these, these outcomes are not comparable across conditions. So NICE prefers um, cost utility analysis, a form of cost effectiveness analysis, where we use the quali. 
the quality is a quality adjusted, adjusted life year. I won't, I won't dwell on that except to say that this is how we compare value across conditions in the health system. But here um, I want to talk about cost benefit analysis because this is what we're going to look at for the impact of noradrenaline approaches. OK, um, well, cost benefit analysis typically considers the impact on resource consumption, not health outcomes, possibly, could be, possibly because the alternative options don't impact health outcomes directly. And the output is net monetary benefit, um, so pounds uh, in this case. And this is also comparable across conditions and applicable both to national and local decision making. OK, so, so now let's look at the cost benefit analysis of noradrenaline and approaches to its um, use, its preparation for hypertensive emergency in ICU. And we're going to look at ready to administer noradrenaline, perhaps a, an aspirational approach for many trusts versus noradrenaline from concentrate, which I think probably represents the current situation for many trusts. So here's our choice. We have A, noradrenaline from concentrate and B, ready to administer noradrenaline. We're, we're comparing B versus A. First of all, we want to measure direct costs and we want to know what the difference is between the direct costs for each strategy. And similarly, we want to then measure the consequential costs between um, the two strategies. And for this analysis, we're looking at a time horizon of, of one year. Um, so what is the sort of analytical framework, if you like, for this cost benefit analysis? Well, we are assuming no differences between strategies in terms of health outcomes, but um, whichever strategy A or B we pick, there won't be a difference in, um, in mortality or quality of life. Um, and we are, in, in choosing that assumption, we're excluding any consequence from a change in risk of dosing error which I think possibly is a, uh, a related factor. So we're going to focus on the differences in, inspect, in expected resource consumption, uh, which we'll measure and cost, which we have measured and, and costed. But what factors are important when um, we're looking at the impact of resource consumption, impact on resource consumption? Well, one, what are the demands of the population we're considering in terms of their need for noradrenaline? What mean daily dose are we considering? What is the clinical variation in quantity and speed of delivery? And what are the variations in the methods um, that we use to prepare and administer noradrenaline? Obviously, this is going to be important. Um, so we break that down. We're looking at um, the ampule sizes that are used and how they're pulled, preparation volume, um, the use of infusion bags versus syringes and vials, which may be smaller. Um, the pumping methods, so um, single, double or volumetric pumping approaches. Um, and as a consequence, the speed of the pump setup, the changeover and, and the priming volumes. Uh, we want to know about the duration um, of preparation, of the preparation tasks and who performs them and how much that costs. Um, and also the frequency of syringe and vial replenish replenishment and also vial replenishment due to sterility uh, guidelines and procedures. So our setting is England, and in this case, we're considering about 4,000 critical care beds. That facilitates about 30,000 cases per year, um, requiring noradrenaline support, and that's about equivalent to 230,000 days of NORAD support. And this may be a conservative figure. Um, and we're considering hypertensive emergency in ICU, as I've said, but more specifically, 80% of cases are going to require 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And we have 10% requiring a, a smaller amount of noradrenaline support and another 10% requiring quite a high amount of noradrenaline support. The strategies A and B, well, in, in a bit more detail, strategy A is noradrenaline from concentrate. We're considering four and eight milligram ampules. Um, 80% of deliveries by um, double, double pumping approach, that's using 50 ml syringe, and 20% by volumetric pumping. We think that might represent a national picture. Um, this is versus 
100% in our aspirational strategy that's ready to use, administer, ready, excuse me, ready to administer noradrenaline. So yes, 100% pre-mix ready to use in four and eight um, milligrams um, using a 50 mil vial. And delivery in every case will be by vol volumetric pump. Um, in both strategies, we're um, preparing at the bedside. Um, we're using nurse time to do that. There are differences in the times um, that are required to uh, draw up and prepare um, the, the vials or infusion bag, as it may be. Um, we are in strategy A. Um, we're making an assumption that we're 80, uh, sorry, we're eight milligrams are required. In 80% of cases, two four mig vials are used, and where higher than eight mig is needed, um, half of the vials will be four milligrams. Uh, in the in the noradrenaline ready to administer strategy, um, vial size is matched to the noradrenaline requirement, um, and this I think represents probably you know, better practice. In both cases, sterility changes will be made at 24 hours. OK, so, so what do we see in terms of the average patient in a day? Well, um, in terms of the number of preparations, uh, strategy B, we're, we're seeing a reduction in the number of preparations required per day. And this is because when we're using volumetric pumping, we use a smaller volume to prime the lines. There's a change in the pattern of four and eight milligrams used when we go to ready to administer noradrenaline. And this is because we have a higher proportion, um, well, the higher proportion of eight milligrams is due to the fact that we are matching the vial size to patient need, representing um, a better, better practice. Uh, OK, and the next line. So wasted noradrenaline from the sterility procedure. We see less waste, less waste here in strategy B. This is because of the 50 milligram vial size. Overall, strategy B represents a better use of noradrenaline. There is a lower consumption of noradrenaline to achieve the same ends. And this is due to the combination of reduced waste from the pumping method that we're using in strategy B, but also um, the vial size being 50 mil versus a proportion at 100 mil in strategy A. What does this mean overall in England over the course of a year? for um, for our, our whole population. Well, um, we're moving from 1.2 million four mig ampules to just well, actually less than 0.1 million and from 0.2 eight mig ampules to 0.6 million. Um, so quite a drop in the number of units of noradrenaline required, but actually an increase in, in the cost of those units, um, even when dextrose saline is taken into account. Um, but I think the, the critical point here is that when we quantify the staff time that is required um, and cost that, we see that there's a considerable reduction in staff time and cost using strategy B. So let's consider the incremental differences between the two strategies. And there's an increase in the drug budget if we move to ready to use administer uh, ready to administer noradrenaline, but there's actually a very large decrease in the recall resource resources required or the cost of resources required. And when we look at FTEs, 11 million pounds, uh, 11 million pound release is equivalent to 167 full time equivalents. And that's half band five and half band six. There's a net monetary benefit of nine million pounds for England when we look at the strategies as I've described them. So final slide, now economics is relevant and it transcends simple budgeting. Now the NHS doesn't have enough money to do everything it would like. If we spend more on one thing, we must do less of something else. We must prioritize interventions with a high health gain per pound spent, all those in this case um, that enable this priority. So perhaps we should ask ourselves, could we do more good by spending money in other ways? OK, um, well, thank you very much. I look forward to some questions.
It, uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope that's provided some clarity on economics. It's always a, a difficult subject, I think, certainly for me. Um, it certainly would be interesting, really, to see how that budget impact model would work in a hospital setting. So I, I think that would be really good to try. Thank you. So finally, it's, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Joseph Tooley, uh, lead pharmacist for ITU, anesthetics and theatres, now at Portsmouth University Hospital NHS Trust. Joe will be speaking to us on steps to safety. The fewer, the better. Thank you, Joe. Good evening. My name is Joe Tooley. I'm a critical care lead pharmacist at Portsmouth Hospital's NHS Trust. I also have a background in pharmacy production and manufacturing and an interest in patient safety initiatives. Today I'll be posing this argument. The fewer steps in the journey from the prescription to the cannula in the patient's arm that you take, the safer your patient and nursing staff will be and the better the overall patient experience in ICU is. These are my disclosures. So I'm going to briefly cover the evidence of the best guess we have as to the true incidence of medication errors on intensive care. And I emphasize it is a best guess. We will discuss the rationale for using ready to administer intravenous products where possible, and then review the evidence base of this decision and see whether it supports the argument. Finally, we will cover some of the challenges I faced in the past with introducing pre-prepared infusion products and what I think are some of the essential steps to achieving this. I see with a high risk environment. This shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. From a medication point of view, our patients have some of the highest number of simultaneous IV prescriptions in any one shift, I think of any clinical cohort, with a high number of these being continuous infusions. A level three patient at any one time requires many hundreds of interventions from their specialist nurse, often with frequent interruption and the need to keep their eye on the patient and the tube at all times. The patient themselves, I would argue, physiologically is particularly intolerant to even fine degrees of inaccuracy. Just think what a 20% change in the concentration of a vasopressor between one syringe and the next could do to an unstable physiology. We also have some of the highest risk drugs available, life-sustaining medicines with extremely short half-lives, complex titration and calculation, and multiple steps involved in the preparation of these products. We still sadly don't have standardized ICS dilutions across the country. And with many of these meds being narrow therapeutic index and increasing pressure on the ICU, there is a greater need than ever before to try and reduce errors. So there are three studies I'd like to um, briefly discuss. Uh, the first is by Tissa et al, which was a prospective observational study. It used pharmacists performed observations on the preparation of infusions in ICU. Of the 2009 IV medicines prepared, 132 were incorrect. A fifth, of we, a fifth of these were deemed to have been potentially life-threatening, and over half of these were accounted for by dosing or preparation errors. In 2009, Andreas Valentin conducted an observational prospective study across 113 ICUs using a self-reporting model. And what they saw was 861 errors affecting 441 patients. Relevant to our um, discussion today, of the 5,034 continuous infusions made up, around 6% or 279 were prepared incorrectly. And in Van der Brent's study, which was a disguised observational study, so the participants did not know they were being audited, nearly 33% of medications were prepared incorrectly. Now, if you're looking at the medication process, there are any number of steps in which we need to obviously think about to try and reduce errors. Now, clearly, I'm going to say that introducing a pharmacist onto your specialist ward round is the best way to get errors down. Uh, but today, we're going to focus on ready-to-use products. There's a number of reasons why you'd want to use um, ready-prepared IV medicines on the ICU. It will reduce the burden on your nursing time, improving um, nurses' availability for clinical activities. It will reduce the wider logistical burden on the unit, so avoiding the need for extra nurses to go off and prepare IVs for staff who are busy with very difficult, agitated patients with multiple interventions. Things like pre-made propofol syringes, if that's your preference for how to give propofol, it will reduce the risk of bloodstream infections. It can mitigate against the errors in calculation, incorrect product selection, dilution, incorrect diluent or labeling errors. Now, in my idealized world, I'd love to be able to send every IV to the ICU from pharmacy as a ready-prepared product, but clearly that's 
prohibited from a cost and logistical reason. And so I think it's important that we focus on the highest risk medicines. In 2007, the NPSA issued an alert on the safer use of injectable medicines. This was in response to an audit the previous year of over 800 reported incidents of medication-related harm from incorrect preparation or administration. That was nearly a quarter of all medication-related incidents that year. A number of process problems were identified and latent system risks, and the recommendations were put in place to try and mitigate this. They said that all injectable medicine products and procedures should be risk assessed where possible and action plans put in place. All trusts should ad adopt a purchasing safety policy to put the procurement of injectable medicines with inherent, med with inherent safety features at the forefront of what they do. This is an example of a risk assessment of two beta pressors commonly used in ICU, and you see that they tick almost all of the risk categories, making them some of the highest risk medicines that you can give. But does it work introducing ready to administer products? So I have two particular studies I'd like to discuss. The first is a study by Maureen Berger et al from 2019. Um, so this was a simulated study in which nurses were randomized to either preparing um, push IVs, I think the two that they used were Ketorolax and Morphine, versus um, pre-prepared, two different versions of pre-prepared product. And what this showed was that it reduced the preparation time to a third of its original time by using a pre-prepared device. And it also significantly reduced the risk of preparation error from uh, around 75% down to just 1.4% by using a pre-prepared product. The other is a fascinating study by Adapa et al. from the British Journal of Anesthesia. So again, it was a simulation study. 48 experienced critical care nurses were put into high-stress simulation scenarios. And they were randomized to either prepare medicines in simulated bed space to know there, or administering pharmaceutical company or a septic unit pre-prepared critical care medicines. The time to prepare the infusion and end concentrations were both analyzed post scenario. What it showed was that out of the 24 noradrenaline infusions made up, only seven out of the 24 actually met the pharmacopoeial standard of being within 10% of the prescribed concentration. And of the adrenaline infusions, only half met the prescribed concentration. One infusion contained no drug at all, and another only contained a fifth of the correct concentration. This showed an odds ratio of de novo preparation error versus ready to administer product 17. It also showed that in a high stress scenario, the time to start a catecholamine infusion is halved on average with the use of a pre made product. Do they work? Yes, I think they do. Based on the evidence we have and based on the experience of everyone I've ever been with who's worked with them, pre made products do reduce error, they do make things safer. There are a number of challenges to implementation in terms of the wider use of pre prepared drugs. Cost is probably the biggest one. A pre-filled product is obviously always going to cost um, more than an ad fuel, which requires further manipulation. You can't work in healthcare without being a healthy client. It's not unreasonable to look at the wider picture, the new misses, the incidents, and consider the financial implications in of worst case scenarios. Waste can be a big problem depending on the product you use. There is a really interesting case report from hospital pharmacy in Hospital Pharmacy Europe written by pharmacist Andrew Parsons at North Bristol discussing implementation of pre-filled noradrenaline syringes and the what issues they had because of the short health shelf life of using an unlicensed product and overestimating their actual requirements. Logistics. Many pre-prepared products, if you're using an unlicensed um, version, will require food storage. If they're a controlled drug, then they require CD storage. You need to make sure you've got enough space, not just on the unit, but also in the pharmacy. And politics can sometimes be challenging. But for me, when I was using uh, pre-prepared, trying to get pre-prepared ketamine made up in RA setting, there was competition with chemotherapy and TPN requirements of the unit, negotiating why ICU's needs are so great. This is a really nice graphic from the STS website which shows you the spectrum of different pre-prepared products that you can look at. Obviously the gold standard is using a license ready to administer product. It will generally have the most convenient storage conditions and the longest shelf life. There is also a legal imperative to use a licensed product where one exists. 
moving down the scale, obviously, when you're buying from uh, unlicensed units or local manufacturing units, generally your shelf life will decrease and your storage conditions become less convenient. So as I said, you can purchase from your local aseptic unit and you may have some advantage in terms of configuring if you have a very specific local need, but you're likely in a product which has a short shelf life and will require more often cold storage conditions. Licensed special manufacturers can give you longer of your shelf life, normally up to a maximum of 59 days, um, but it's still an unlicensed product that will often still have not particularly convenient storage conditions. Or you can purchase a licensed product from a pharmaceutical manufacturer, which is by the NHRA considered to be a gold standard. So if I have you to start looking at um, ready to administer products on your ICU, these are the next steps I think you should take. Involve your pharmacist. We can negotiate a way around the formula agency. We can help think about things like the logistics, the costs, helping putting assets together, helping think about procurement and lead time. Involve your nurses, look at where the pinpoints are, where the process problems are on your unit, and where they need your help in getting a convenient process in place. Speak to your government leads, analyze local incident data, what have been used, where have been the risks, and where could pre filled products help reduce those risks. Analyze your local processes and match your time to prepare. Cost is going to be a barrier at formulary committee, so you need to put a wider picture. Look at the cost of potential um, errors. Look at the cost of compensation. Look at the cost of nursing time and how you can reduce that, improving your processes. And cost effective. I think it's really useful to trial a product on the unit and see how it um, works for processes. This just has to be done carefully. You can't have freebies. You can't have free. So what you normally need to do is put a short form application in to use a small batch size that works and then go to full application. So in conclusion, medication can be improved by the use of pre-filled products, but it does need careful planning, analysis, and discussion with your local team. And please do involve your pharmacist. It can be really useful. Thank you very much. Joe, thank you uh, so much for such an impactful uh, presentation. And uh, thank you to all of the speakers for their time uh, and great talks. Um, I believe I'll now be joined by the speakers. Um, we, we were going to answer a, a few questions. Um, now, we, we have run out of, of time. Um, there were quite a lot of questions which people have answered in the Q&A. Um, and I see the panel have, have been answering them. Um, I think just just so that we could we could wrap it up for those people that have made other plans, we'll finish off the webinar. But if if you want to hold on towards the end, I think it probably will be worth discussing a few of the questions that came up. Quite a lot of uh, practical questions for Elaine. I, I think a question for Ed, which um, I certainly asked Ed about how do you extract that nursing time cost? So if you don't mind, if, if I could just... Um, move on a little bit just to a few of the promotions. Um, if you haven't already had a chance, you may want to listen to the Synthetica podcast, Untamed Synthetica, um, where we speak to Elaine, Justin and Joe, and as we say, delve a little deeper uh, behind their story. Uh, of course, uh, we have the Intensive Care uh, Society State of the Art meeting coming up and Synthetica are uh, proud to be headline sponsors uh, of this virtual conference being held between the 6th and 8th of December this year. Yes, this year. The conference will be running over three days, enabling delegates to join from wherever they are in the world. <clears throat> State of the Art 21 will provide a wealth of opportunities for both delegates and industry to interact and will be the first time in 18 months that a conference of this size will be held in the UK. Early bird rate is available until the 30th of July, 2021. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening and again to all of our speakers for uh, attending and listening to this RCS webinar. Uh, this is the end of the webinar. If you'd like to stay, as I said, we will, um, we'll, for the next few minutes, we'll be playing out with Synthetica's NHS Heroes video. And after that, uh, we'll discuss a few of the questions. 
Matt, could you play the video, please? It wasn't something any of us saw coming, and it hit us harder than we could have imagined. We had a sudden influx of patients onto the intensive care. Nobody could have imagined this new invading virus could spread as easily as catching a common cold or could cause so much suffering and hardship. I looked around at my fellow nurses. We all knew we had a challenge on our hands. Then the country locked down. The ICU became overwhelmed and we were fearful of catching the virus ourselves. I was worried I wasn't properly protected. Was my mask fitting correctly? Was I following procedure correctly? The protective equipment marked my face. I was often dehydrated and had a headache at the end of a shift. I was physically and emotionally exhausted. We were all working in conditions that none of us had ever encountered. It was our skill, experience and courage that got us through. We paused and took stock, reflected on our actions, evaluated our practices and made sure we did not lose what we'd learnt from this ordeal. Practices like the mixing of medicines at the bedside were identified as critical practices. This practice wasted nursing time, increased risks and was not safe. Having two nurses to check drugs was not efficient. We needed ready to use and ready to administer medicines. You have to bear in mind we were wearing full personal protective equipment and working in such challenging conditions. Respecting, valuing and listening to nurses on the intensive care meant that we were prepared for any resurgence of the coronavirus pandemic. We had learnt how to optimise our time and expertise. We'd stopped wasting time mixing medicines at the bedside. We knew what worked best for the safe and effective care of our patients. We were and are the heroes of the NHS. Right, well, I see, uh, I see a few of you are still there. I, I did forget, uh, I did forget one thank you, and of course that's to our um, our sponsor, Synthetica. Thank you very much for sponsoring this event. Um, right. Um, it looks like Elaine. I know Elaine was actually busy, so she's she's had to leave us. Um, perhaps, perhaps Justin or Joe could help with uh, some of the questions. Um, I, I I I mean, some of them are really practical, which uh, were sort of for Elaine, kind of. Um, what, what do you use? What, what are the concentrations available? I guess I could answer that one. Um, we should all be using the RCS Faculty of Intensive Care standard concentrations, shouldn't we, Justin? Uh, which is 4 and 50, 8 and 50, 16 and 50, or 16 and 100, 32 and 100. Oh God, have I got that right? I missed one, didn't I? But, but the, the, the standardized concentrations um, and ready to administer um, products in vials are available in four and fifties and eight and fifties. Um, so we, we had quite a few questions about the changing of the giving set. Um, and um, I see Justin answered that. And it's it pretty much does come down to uh, the model, the, the, the guideline in your hospital. Um, oh. Beg your pardon. I, I can see you're 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 all watching my my lovely green screen. And Elaine's here as well. What's that? Intense. And Elaine is still here as well. <laughs> Where is she? <laughs> Hello, Elaine. <laughs> uh, come on, Elaine. That's not like you. Well, I was just so, laughing. Why, why did Why don't you tell us then about? Um, well, actually, yeah. So, so the change the change over period. How you change over the syringe. Uh, why why doesn't a volumetric system affect the blood pressure like double pumping might? Um, stop me talking, Elaine, over to you. I will try and stop you talking <laughs> over. I will do my best. Um, so we went over to the volumetric pumps purely because we could use a larger volume of fluid. So we use the same concentrations, um, same standard concentrations, but it's a larger volume of fluid. So we don't need to actually do um, changes of the lines as frequently. 
uh, is a lot easier because as long as you've got the chamber filled up in the giving set, you just need to take off the old bag, respike the new bag, and there's an absolutely no issues at all. Um, for us, we do seem to change our uh, giving sets every 24 hours. And I have to say, I have been thinking about, about that, but I think obviously every, every intensive care is different. They do things differently. So um, for us, it literally is, we use, a, we use an octopus, we have one running, and then we um, we start we start the next one, and we can just stop it and then change it over. So um, very little he he hemodynamic instability now since we've been using the volumetric pumps. They're pretty accurate, the ones that we the ones that we have. But I'm sure that all of you guys that use volumetric pumps, um, whatever brand they are, um, they have they you know they are set to to deliver. You know what you set them at between you know give or take 10 percent so there has to be a, a certain degree of accuracy anyway uh so it's just worked really well for us so it's just it's just our experience really uh, elaine thank you uh, i've got rid of that horrible green background um so yeah i mean i think it's probably worth mentioning there are other pumps um uh, certainly we, we use b brawn uh, and i know that the industry standard is being at least three percent uh, uh variance so I mean that's if you're giving 10 mils 10.3 mils is that that's correct isn't it Justin um I, a question a lot of people asked and wasn't actually asked in the Q&A is uh, what happens if you get air in the system another one for Elaine maybe we well we don't is that a problem no, it, oh, okay. it, it isn't. No, um, as long as you've primed the giving set properly and you keep the chamber filled, we don't, we, I have to say that's really interesting, you just mentioned it, we haven't had a problem with air in the air in the line at all. Um, so it's all about preparation, isn't it? Preparation is key for everything. So as long as the staff are all trained with their IVs and how to run through the giving sets properly, there shouldn't be issues with any air bubbles. Um, and as long as the chambers are, are full, uh, then that, again, it, it ha certainly hasn't been an issue for us. I think people extrapolate their experience a bit from using propofol this way. The propofol seems to be a lot more uh, susceptible to getting bubbles in the set. In, in my experience, <laughs> um, I'm glad you're nodding. Like, <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, and so I think people are always worried about that because it's a bit more standard to use propofol in this way and people often see bubbles and have to be flicked out. But because of the physicochemical properties of, of the noradrenaline solution, you just don't get it and the bubbles don't seem to fall. I need to apologise. I clicked. Thank you. Kevin Bazaz asked the question. I said I would answer it live. I didn't mean to. That was that was an awful. I, I meant to type an answer, but it was too late. So I ought to give you the, the dutiful answer. So you, one is there one strength ready to administer norad? No. As Oliver has said, there are a couple. Um, so double and quad strengths. Um, and we do still have a stock of ampules because, you know, every now and again, you get a rush on, et cetera, and things like that. And, uh, and you just need to have a bit of a backup. But for the most part, it's the ready to administer. So, um, Justin and Elaine, that, that was a question that came out was, um, what if you have to use a 16 milligram and 50 uh, strength? What do you do then? Do, do you just increase the rate of the 8 and 50? Uh, yeah, you can you can do that, um, but yeah, I mean, we used the we used the sixteen um, in fifty. Um, you know, that's what we started off with. I think at the end of the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, so obviously, you're giving a a, a lot less. You're giving a, the rate is a lot reduced, isn't it? So you're not actually going through it um, generally as quickly. So okay. um, yeah, that's that's the one that we we first started using. So well, uh, like Justin. Sorry, sorry. I, I, I have an admission, first of all, because I also pressed the wrong button. Uh, and I was asked, well, would the webinar be available uh, later? Yes, it will It'll be on the Intensive Care Society's web, website and later, later in the week, I'm told. Justin, sorry. No, one, I was just thinking one of the other things that people get uh, in a bit of a tizz about and there are questions um, is that the ready to administer noradrenaline is made up in a saline solution and lots of units are using dextrose because they want to get away from saline diluents but the amount of saline in it is minuscule if you look at you know saline requirements etc it really doesn't add very much at all if 
I was to share my screen now, you'd have a look at my IV fluid management and hyper hyponatremic guideline that's in the background here. And obviously you do have to take into account total sodium and chloride administration levels when you're managing these patients. But for the ready to administer preparations, it's really not something you have to factor about. I, I think a whole day would be equivalent to something like 40 mils of normal saline. So, so that's not very much really, is it? I did want to pick up on a point because you mentioned you, you keep the ampules around. And I think I, just to clarify that the ready to administer products, um, they, they are varying on the market, um, but they do have at least an 18 month shelf life. So you can certainly hold a lot of stock. Um, and so, and so they're, they're really, you know, from that perspective, it's, it's not like uh, some of the uh, pre-filled syringes that you may get that will only last for, and Joe, I'm, I'm looking at you to correct me if I'm wrong, it's just about, yeah. about three months, right? And they've yeah, got to so be the, kept in the fridge. Yes, yeah, some, I'm, I'm not, some have sorry, to be kept Joe, in the fridge, um, but even the ones that aren't fridge storage, that for a, an unlicensed unit, the maximum shelf life that they can give it under the MHRA sort of section 10, all that kind of thing would be would be 89 days. So you you and that you, you know if you look at well certainly for us when we were buying in licensed midazolam pre-filled and unlicensed morphine pre-filled the difference was striking in that the midazolam we were able to get through even as the pandemic wound down and the morphine we were pouring it all away because when you get dips it goes out of date you're throwing it away and then you get a peak and you've you know you've, you've wasted it and you've got to buy more in um, so yes, that is a big issue if you're going to look at ready to administer products and you're using unlicensed products, whatever that may be, is you need to bear in mind the short, the short shelf life because it is problematic. Because I guess there's, there needs to be a bit more clarity around the whole syringes thing, which, which really Justin's presentation was talking to, because um, there certainly is a place for a pre-filled syringe, isn't there? Like, you know, mini jets and when you need to give adrenaline or amiodarone in, in a hurry, but, it, but it, this is not the same sort of environment, really, is it? No, no, it's not. Um, and as you said, there are, there is a role for it. And certainly in Portsmouth, we introduced small pre-filled syringes of ketamine for our um, induction grab bags. And, you know, that made a big difference from a patient safety point of view. So I don't want people to dismiss their local aseptic units altogether. There are things they can do for you but they do come with challenges and problems. And as you say, with a prolonged continuous infusion, having actually a nice, small, compact, I would, I would tap in on the logistics element in that storing all of these big pre-filled syringes on your ICU is also a challenge and finding, you know, fridge space for these products is really difficult. Whereas a lot of the ready to administer, you know, the, the vials are nice and small and you can fit a lot more of them in your cupboard. Okay, all right. Very good. Now, now Ed, I, you, you're probably feeling a little bit left out there, but uh, I think I, I might have asked you this question. You know, when, when you look at that budget impact model, um, you know, the question I, I, I think I asked you was, well, how, how do you actually extract that cost of nursing time? You know, and um, I, I guess it's we, we're so used to that siloed thinking, what is the unit cost? What is the acquisition cost? And it's difficult for us to then consider what, what's the nursing time cost mm. and how do we, how does that translate? Can, can you, can you help explain that a little bit to us? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, okay. I, so I suppose there's um, the, the technical answer is um, um, we, we, we monetize the uh, resource released in terms of hours. And that's what you have there. A quantified amount is um, 167 full-time equivalents is, about 11 million pounds worth of spend but I think the you know the reality is that for each individual unit um, that isn't perhaps something that you, you, one wouldn't want to consider it in those terms um, the point was very well, well made by Elaine at the start what we're really talking about is the release of time to care so what we see is uh, in this calculation really is just an illustration of the amount of time if we're needing to quantify it. Um, you know, uh, it, is, it is 167 in this example, the assumptions we've made um, full-time equivalents, but I, that, that, that isn't to say that um, 
uh, across the NHS, we would expect to see 167 nurses released to other duties, um, sort of in a, in a formal sense. Uh, so hopefully that, that that answers your question. But uh, just to underline, you know, the this is assumptions around a national picture, and every unit in in, in the country will will have their own individual assumptions and setups, and, and resource release will look slightly different for each. Thank you. Um, Elaine, part, part of the, the question was, um, how would you see, sorry, what did they say? Uh, you won't see the money, uh, just the time. Uh, how, would, how would you respond to that? I mean, personally in your care, I mean, what, what, what did it mean? And what, I mean, how would you answer that? Well, you won't see, you won't see the money. How can you extract that cost? Well, um, I think having the time to actually care for your patients and particularly during the pandemic, as I explained, to do the little things that we didn't have the time for, uh, actually kind of like just kind of makes it a bit more worthwhile. Um, so the, I think that freeing, freeing us up to perform the job that, that we're actually paid for to look after the patients to, to the best of our ability is, is actually is extremely important. Um, and something I'm actually quite passionate about. Uh, so I think that, yeah, that sort of, in, in my mind, although that may not be what everybody else thinks, that, that sort of makes makes up for it really. Um, just giving us that free time to do to do the things that we that we should be doing. Thank you, Lynn. And Justin, I, I know you, you always express this in relative costs of other things. Um, What's your take on it? Um, a lot of things that we want to try and do uh, are constrained by how much money there is in the pot. Um, and so what we often find as well is that we get situations with silo budgeting. Um, and when you're looking at cost improvements, often what comes out of your budget um, you may end up delivering things that have impact further down the line. So if, if Elaine's able to deliver better care and then is able to reduce a pressure sore, pressure ulcer and stuff like that, and that shaves off two days in hospital overall, that doesn't necessarily go on to your individual departmental budget. So you don't actually realise that. And that's the problem is that sometimes the expenditure is seen just in one department and actually what you don't have is a grasp of the whole bottom line. So anything that you can do to improve the whole patient care and reduce you know, what you spend and reduce the time in hospital, when you're looking at this, presenting it to a DNP committee and stuff like that, it's going to be for the benefit of it. And th these are the broad terms that people need to think in terms of. Thank you, Justin. Um, just before we go on to two other quick questions, um, I was just thinking, you know, when, when I started uh, this journey of looking into ready to administer products, it, it, it really struck me uh, when I realized that almost the entire Australia and the United States use volumetric pumps for um, the delivery of vasopressors. I just always assumed that everybody was using uh, syringe pumps. And in fact, about 20% of the UK uh, are using volumetrics uh, already. So it's it's not really a, a new thing or challenging thing, but most of the world's doing it. It, it appears perhaps, perhaps we haven't changed yet. Um, so there's a question from uh, Alison saying, have you found any increase in peripheral ischemia by using higher concentrations of noradrenaline? Uh, Justin? No, we haven't. Um, and, you know, hmm. I'd ask Alan if she, use, if she uses vasopressin, then she, she'll see peripheral ischemia. Um, in the UK, often we get twitchy at one microgram per kilogram per minute as a maximum dose of noradrenaline. Some people will sort of set that as an arbitrary threshold for cardiovascular failure. But if you look in Southern Europe, I'll happily go up to doses of three, four mics per kilo per minute. So in the UK, you know, we don't use anything like that. And, and you know, it's that balance then, isn't it? You know, keeping the patient alive to transition them through to to get them to a recovery sure. at the expense of a, of a few uh, expense of a few fingers and stuff, but no, definitely not. No, we haven't seen, uh, and not even in COVID times. So I, I think we're going to come to the last question here, um, Joe. This might be a commercially sensitive one, so see if you can answer it uh, 
uh, in, in a sensitive manner, but the question is from PG7, where are we getting these ready to use or ready to administer vials from? Well, I'm certainly the... The pharmacy, when, I know. Yeah. When, when we in Surrey looked at getting the noradrenaline in, we used the Synthetica product um, because that seemed to tick all the boxes for me in terms of pricing and shelf life and availability. In COVID, availability of all of the drugs was a particular issue. So we were I was approaching lots of companies for lots of different drugs to see whether they could meet demand and quite a lot of them ended up falling short and we were swapping between them whereas Synthetica had a very large supply that they prepared that was readily available so there wasn't a concern about supply so that's that's what I that's what I used okay. I can only tell you that's what I used um, I think looking you know more drugs you'd have to speak to your pharmacy teams to see what's available but that's that's what I went with he said so, it the, and the magic word there Brexit <laughs> Given Brexit, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm feeling uncomfortable discussing this too much. Really, um, I, I, I mean, look, all, all I could say is that these drugs are available on the NHS framework. Yeah. Um, there, there will, there will be no issue with Brexit. Um, the supply chain is steady. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I can't speak for 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 other drugs. I, I don't, I don't really know, but I, I'm, I'm not aware of any issues with the uh, Sonora product. Certainly, I don't think we've All seen right. the Brexit effect for any drugs yet. If there's going to be a Brexit effect, it's not that's not been the problem. It's just been the sheer turnover of medicines in COVID that's been the issue. All right. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Uh, did anybody else see any other questions or any other questions that they felt haven't been answered, or are we drawing to an unnatural end? There was a quick practical question there that Alison asked for Squirrel, wasn't it? Do you set a VTBI? on the infusions? Uh, some of the girls do, yeah, some of them do. Um, it, for, for, for the noradrenaline, um, actually I don't, but the, <laughs> we should, perhaps I shouldn't say that, uh, but some of the girls do. But um, as long as we um, we're obviously put in your rate, uh, the, yeah, the, I suppose the volume to be infused, yeah, yeah, on the whole. No, Sorry, I'm, some... I'm, I'm, right. I'm flagging because I haven't had anything to eat. So, <laughs> well, obviously, you can't um, speak for the boy nurses as well. I speak for the boy I, nurses. I, as well. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to bring the webinar to a close. Um, I do want to, I do want to thank uh, Lizzie, who's put some comments in the chat box, mm -hmm. which would be very complimentary. So, thank you very much. Um, uh, that, that's, that's to the team. That's to you guys. And a big thank you from me again. Um, uh, you guys have been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Good night. Thank everybody. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.